Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Bright Star. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love in our lives. Thank you for your uh, word that uh, your Holy Spirit uses to teach us about Jesus, our Lord and our Savior and our Prince. Open our eyes, uh, the eyes of our understanding, and open our spirit to receive your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we started a really fascinating series on the fruit of the Spirit. And um, I, I think I'm going to have to go back and, and re-record that because for whatever reason our sound was out last week. And it was just, to me, one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite openings to a session. I want to do, do that one all over again just for the fun of it. But what we learned last week was a couple of a key points. One is the Holy Spirit will bring fruit into our life. And when Paul said, you know, this is, this is the fruit of the Spirit, he used the singular is rather than the plural are. What he was saying is that all these nine things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc., was fruit of the Spirit. He wasn't saying these were separate fruit. He was saying that these were different facets of the same fruit that God develops in our life, kind of like a diamond. When you look at it from one facet, the, you know, the, the light uh, waves are going in from one perspective and you see this and you turn the facet around, light's going in from a different perspective and you see that. I think that's what makes a diamond so fascinating is it's a singular stone but it's got such different aspects of its beauty depending on how you turn it. And that's the very nature of God. I mean, his the, the, the fruit of the Spirit is basically the Holy Spirit producing in us the attributes, the essence of God. And so that's, that's one point. The other point, and the most important point, is it is the Holy Spirit that does it. We, you know, we, we can't produce any fruit in our life. We can't produce love or joy or any of those aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And, 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 and we aren't intended to. God is able by... His, uh, first of all, we know that God created us in the, in the first place. So He created our bodies. He created our souls. He created our spirit. So he knows how to mold us together. Some of us may be less perfectly than others, but I mean, he's, he's, he knew how to mold us together. He can, he can, it's just as easy for him to take his Holy Spirit with his new creation and mold in us, transform us into the image of his Son, which is what the fruit of the Spirit is manifested as. If that makes sense, when you're looking at Jesus, you see the fruit of the Spirit because that is the nature of God. It's the essence of God. So it's just really fascinating to open up the whole concept and to understand at the very outset that this is not a to-do list. It's not something we read and go, oh man, my goodness, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to be more patient, I got to be more gentle, I got to be more kind. When we, when we do that, what we find is that we frustrate ourselves because when we are thinking about being more kind, what we're thinking about is that we are not being kind. And when we think about not being kind, we find ourselves focusing on the not kind rather than the kind, and we end up being more not kind. But we don't have to do that. All we need to focus on is Jesus. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit transforms us and creates this fruit in our life. So let's dig in and talk about the first facet of the fruit. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna admit up front this could be a half a dozen sessions all by itself because we're talking about love. Love is the first thing referenced in the fruit of the Spirit. When you stop and think about it, it makes sense. I mean, the very nature of God himself, he said, John tells us in John, uh, 1 John 4 that God is love. And so naturally the first aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is love. When Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, because, you know, you got the Ten Commandments and then you have the Law of Moses. I mean, there's a lot of law in there. But when Jesus was asked what's the greatest of the commandments, this is what he declared in Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So Jesus says, you know, all of the law that was given, it was given for two basic reasons. One is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and, and love your neighbor. 
impossible commands when you stop and think about it. And listen, it gets harder. Not only is it impossible for us to love God in ourselves, it's impossible to love our neighbors in ourselves. And we need to understand a little bit about the nature of love. There are four general types of love. One is the, the uh, it's called stored or storage. It is the, the, the love that is an affection for somebody. And then there's philia, which is, which is brotherhood. Um, that's, what the, that's what the city of Philadelphia is named after, the, the city of brotherly love. That's what philia means. And then there's eros, where we get our term erotic. It's passionate love, the kind of love that's in, like in a marriage. And then the last one is, is, is called agape. It means selfless love or unconditional love, meaning love that's extended to you without condition. And that's the love that Jesus commanded. He said, I want you to love the Lord without condition. And I want you to love the other, the others, your brother, without condition. I want you to show God, God's love, and show your brother God's love. An impossible command. See, the word, the, the word that Jesus used here when he says love the Lord, you know, and love your neighbor is the word um, agaposis. It's the verb tense of the a word agape. A word agape literally means love feast. When God loves us, he's, you know, we, we are just feasting on his love. It's an unconditional love that flowed from God. And it's a noun. So let's camp here for a minute and just kind of discuss that. You know, we hear often that love is an action. I mean, when people want to show that they think what they think to be love, they engage in some sort of conduct that, that they believe demonstrates love in some degree or another. Right? We all do. I mean, you got someone, you know, helps a stranger fix a flat tire. You've got a friend helping you remove the couch. You know, you got a family member helping the other family member with a surprise party. A mother comforts a kid with a scraped knee. You know, those are all actions that we engage in to demonstrate love. And it appears like an expression of love. Love. Like, yet, you know, if 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 each of these actors aren't really, have never really experienced the love of God, they're missing the most important aspect of love. And that is love that's done unconditionally. I mean, in the end, for the most part, humans are pretty self-preserving and self-serving. M you know, many, many times what we do, we have some motivation, some selfish motivation in doing it. Even, even a good motivation. It's like, well, it makes me feel good to help you. You know, that's a good motivation. But love is different. Love has no 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 self-motivation at all. The, the love that flows from God is, is totally outward. It's never inward. And so we need to understand this word agape, it's a noun, which means that it is an object. Now listen, God is love. God is the ultimate and supreme being in existence, and love is his essence. It's his being. You know what God is not? He is not the action of love. He is love. See, a basketball is not the action of a jump shot. An object is not an action. An object simply is. Do you understand the difference? A noun. Agape is a noun. God is love. It, it's a state of being. It is not an action. Now, we can use the object for an action, but it doesn't convert the object to an action. See, we can throw a ball, right? We've thrown the ball. But the ball remains a ball. It may bounce. That's an action. But it's the ball doing the action. The ball doesn't change. The ball stays being a ball. It doesn't act like a ball. It is a ball. See, we tend to term things in, 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 by what people do or what people say. They're actions. What God's trying to say here, what Jesus saying, John is saying here is God is the object that all of the actions of kind, loving expressions stem from. 
but it starts with an object. It starts with the love that is, that is God, the love, the love that flows from him. See, God is not the author of love. God is love. And guess what? We are not. So, you know, the only thing that we can do when it comes to agape love is to take the same love that he is pouring out into our world and reflecting it back to him and radiating it to others. Love doesn't originate with us. That's why this, this command of Jesus was so impossible. How in the world can we love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves? How can we do that if love does not originate with us? Well, Jesus answered that question. I mean, he's not going to give us a charge if he doesn't give the ability to do it, to pull it off. So here's what he says in John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Okay, same impossible charge. But then he says, here's the answer. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. So is he saying, the only way you're ever going to be able to show love to your neighbor the way I want you to show love to your neighbor is for you first to experience and receive my love. Which means that you know our mindset has to be, he loves me and I want to receive that. I cannot express love without first receiving his love. And then he says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. What? I thought I was supposed to preach on a street corner. I thought I was supposed to do this or that to show them that I'm the light of the world. I'm so, I thought I was supposed to show them how much I love God. He says, no, the way you show the world that you are from me the way you show the world that you are my disciples is that if you love one another. That love that he shows us is agape love. It's called, the, the actual Greek word is agape. It's the verb tense of agape. The way he has loved us, that's a verb, is the way we're to love others. And of course, how did Jesus love us? Well, he, he paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, you understand, what Jesus did on the cross was not a big price. It wasn't that he gave a large portion of what he had to, to, to redeem us. Jesus gave everything. He gave everything, including his life. There was nothing more that he could give to demonstrate his incredible love for us. He showed perfect love because he gave everything that he had, including himself. That's a God of love. So how do, how, do, how do we learn to love like that? How do we show someone agape love? Well, you won't be surprised to hear me say, you focus on Jesus Christ. See, the Holy Spirit knows how to take the focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truths that are in it and change us because when we're focused on him, the Holy Spirit transforms us into the image of Jesus as we focus on him more and more. See, 1 John 4, 9 through 10, John says, this is how God's love was revealed among us. That would be a good question to answer, right? Then how, how do we love? How do we, how do we recognize that love? Well, here's what he says. This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. And love consists of this. Not that we love God. Praise God. <laughs> because we do it ineffectively, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifices for our sins. Right? So we're drawn by the incredible love the Father has showed us because of him sending Jesus to die for our sins. And when we believe that, we repent of not believing and accepting it, and we confess Christ and the Holy Spirit transforms us into a new creation. And then he indwells us and then when he indwells us, he confirms that we are justified before the Father by faith. The Father is not judging us for sin anymore. He has, he has through Jesus, redeemed us, purchased us with a price, delivered us from the slavery of sin, and justified us in his presence. And we learn that we no longer have to fear his judgment. 
See, that's, that's the demonstration of how God showed us that he first loved us, is that he died for us. You know, when Paul in Romans chapter 4 was talking about how Abraham was justified by faith, not by works. And, you know, he had faith in God's promises. He chose to believe God, that God was going to send him the son of promise, even though he was 99 years old and Sarah was 89 years old. She couldn't have kids and he was too old. But he believed God anyway, and ultimately they had Isaac. And, 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 and Paul tells us that that belief in God's promises that justified Abraham before God in terms of righteousness. Abraham was, it was accounted to him as righteousness, right standing with God, not because of what Abraham did or didn't do, it was because he believed the promise. And, Paul, when he's t and then he goes on in, in the beginning of chapter 5 after laying that background and says this. Romans 5, 1 through 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, he's basically telling us, we are children of Abraham's when we believe the promise too. And because we are just, when we believe, that's faith. And, we, and because of our faith, we are justified. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace, this unmerited favor in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given, who's been given to us. What's the end result? of our faith in the promises of God, the love of God, this agape, is poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So let's walk through the process. We believe Jesus died for us. Then he justified us before God so as not to be subject to his wrath. Rather, we have peace to stand in his unmerited favor toward us through that faith. And we rejoice in that assurance of spending eternity with him, who Jesus Christ is our great hope, right? So in the meantime, we're here on the, in the world. We rejoice in the things that the world brings our way because of the process that the Holy Spirit brings us through. Do, we re, do I rejoice in calamity? I do not. But I rejoice in the hope of what the Holy Spirit's going to develop in my life when trouble comes my way. I mean, the Holy Spirit knows how to take everything and work it to the get to, together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Does God bring calamity in our lives? No. But do we live in a fallen world? Yes. And sometimes the things happen. But the Holy Spirit knows how to take those things and develop in us a hope, a spirit of rejoicing of what He's going to accomplish. So He says, He says, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce what? Perseverance. What do tribulations do? They drive us to our knees. They drive us to seeking the Lord and trusting in his deliverance and his protection and his presence in our lives. And when we see him do that over and over again, he builds our faith and it makes us persevere. We don't give up. We go, I know this looks bad. I know this looks like it's not going to end. But I know my God and he's bigger than that. And he will be here when that has passed. That's perseverance. Because he, we rejoice in, in knowing what, what he's able to do because he's shown us over and over again how faithful he is. And that process just teaches us to hang in there and wait on his faithfulness. That's, that's, that produces character. Perseverance produces character. Character through someone who's been tried and, is, and, and has trust in us. We can... That character means we, we've, been, we've learned to trust him and we're hanging in there to trust him. That's character. And all that culminates in hope. And hope's not wishes. It's not, yeah, I wish, I really would like this, but I don't know. It's an absolute assurance of his faithfulness that he will never leave us and that he will never forsake us. It's a hope. In Jesus Christ, our great hope. That assurance of knowing we're in him. And then Paul goes on to say that hope does not disappoint in the sense that's a futile effort. 
It's an absolute assurance because the Holy Spirit proves us how much God loves us and pours out his unconditional love in our lives. So see the, see the process? Even in the world we have tribulations, but those tribulations drive, to, drive us to our knees and they give us perseverance. And that perseverance develops the character to know we can hang in there and God will see us, see it to the end and be there at the end. And it gives us that hope in everything we do. And because of that, the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So see, that's how the Lord develops his love in our life. That's how he demonstrates his love. We know Jesus Christ died for our sins. We'll never be judged again by God for sin. We'll never be condemned to death for sin by God. So that knowledge has the culminating effect of us appreciating everything that God has done for us and recognizing that, that, that he did that out of his love for us, his unconditional love for us. And so his love is shed abroad in our heart. And when you really begin to understand that, and you really begin to appreciate that, it's easy to extend love to other people because all you want to do is share with them what God has done in your life. It's easy to talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ if you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is, by, it is, it is grace by faith we are saved. That's the gospel. Now let's take a quick look about what love is not. Because it can be confusing. Paul made it very clear in, 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 in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. He, that's the chapter on love. We've all read it. But here's how he begins. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Now think about the litany that he, that he goes through here. I can be an incredibly talented speaker. I can be persuasive. I can be, you know, just mesmerizing. But if I don't have love, I'm just sound, meaningless sound. And if I'm all wise and all knowing, I'm the smartest guy that ever lived without love, that just, you know what that does? That makes me puffed up and self conceited. And if I have unimaginable power, you know, like one of these uh, superheroes that we see, and they leap over tall buildings with a single bound and outrun a speeding bullet and, you know, in immeasurable strength, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. And if I have all the faith in the world but don't have it, have love in expressing it, it's useless. It, 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 it falls dead. If I give everything that I have and have not love, I have given nothing. See, Paul's saying all of these things have to do with our self, our talents, our power, our goods, our faith, our, our, our. Paul said that's nothing. And finally, we need to understand love is not a check, this, this thing, this, these attributes of love, that, that we, they're not a checklist of things to do. I mean, the very notion that you would think about these attributes of love as something that you need to pull off demonstrates that you have the wrong motivation in itself. Because although we have a motivation to love, we never can love the way God loves unless we're experiencing his love. And when we experience his love, we naturally radiate it to others because that nature has been developed in our life and we can't, we can't change that. We find ourselves loving and we haven't even realized we're loving. We're just, we're just emulating the, 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 the life that God has molded in us. And that portrays his love. So Paul goes on and says, okay, well, if it's not talent, not you know, knowledge and gifts and power and faith and means... And what is love? Now listen to this and tell me if you can see any self-serving motivation in any of these. Listen to this very carefully. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and then 13 says this. Love suffers long and is kind. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. 
thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And then the, in verse 13 says, and now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. See? When Paul says love is not, he's talking about love as not thing that, that it stems from a selfish motivation of any kind, even if it's a good selfish motivation. He's saying the love of God, the characteristic of love is just that. It's characteristics. It's not a to-do list. It's not something that, that we choose to do. It's just something that naturally flows from knowing the love of God in our life. It's a heart condition. It is a state of being. It's just like Christianity. I don't, I'm not a Christian because I put on a badge one day that says I'm a Christian. That I can take off and decide later to be a Mormon. Or decide to be Islam. See, that's a declaration of action. Now, when I'm born again, my state of being has changed. I am a new creation. Same thing with love. Love is a state of being. See, it wants to do good for and out of all things. I mean, its nature is to give room and latitude. It has no selfish motivation. It doesn't even think of itself. Pride and self-interest don't even factor in. And so because of that, see, it's not provoked if it's, not mis if it's misunderstood. Because sooner or later it will be understood. It's not cynical. It's not hypocritical. There's nothing about it that enjoys hurt or evil. It is not vile in any respect. It loves truth. And it, it bears up under the heaviest burdens and prevails. It never doubts. It never gives up. It never grow ti grows tired and is never weary. It is more hardy than the Energizer Bunny. It never runs out of steam. You understand, a lot of people, if you ask the average person what's the most powerful force in the universe, they're going to talk about some sort of strength that can move mountains or, you know, lay waste valleys or whatever. But love is the most powerful force in the universe. Love can lay mountains bare, can cross seas, can weather storms. It is indefatigable. It doesn't ever tire. It's like water on a rock. Over time, that rock will be sawn clean in two. Love never fails. That's what the love of God is. So when Paul's saying here at the end, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love, here's what he says. Faith is that we can truly trust God. That's a good thing. Hope is that we will we not only trust him, but we know that what he's promised is going to happen. We'll be with him forever. In pure goodness, in pure love. But love, that's his very nature. It's eternal. And the Holy Spirit brings it forth in our lives by a simply abiding in Jesus. It's just like we talked about last week. Jesus talked about it in John 15. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. My Father is the vine dresser. We talked about that. He said, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. That's it. That's it. If you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. If you don't, you'll be cut off and thrown in the fire. You know why? Because the moment you're cut off from Jesus, you don't bear any fruit because it's not you that bring the fruit into your life. It's the vine. So when we're connected with Jesus, we're just staying focused on Jesus. The Holy Spirit knows how to bring forth this fruit in our life. And he does it. And we can be assured that he does it. We don't have to doubt that he will do it. He will do it. Our job <laughs> it's just to stay focused on Jesus so he can. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. We could talk about this for weeks on end and never really uh, plunge the depths of how wide and deep and high and, 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 and great is the love that you have for us. But your Holy Spirit knows how to reveal your love to us as we focus on you. Help us to be spoke locked on Jesus so your love will be manifested in our lives so that the Holy Spirit can bring forth that fruit 
in Jesus' name, amen.